Thank you very much. And now we'll go to page four of the agenda, and it's item L under reports. The first report is the fire department, and the subject, seismologist Dr. Lucy Jones, to address the city council concerning earthquake risk to the Oxnard community. The recommendation is that uh, seismologist uh, Dr. Lucy Jones, a world-renowned expert on earthquakes, is to address the city council concerning the earthquake risk to our region and city, and we'll have the Fire Chief uh, Darwin Base um, start the presentation, please. Well, good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, Council and staff, and we do have that famous seismologist, Dr. Lucy Jones, sitting here in the audience. She works her way up here. So she's going to talk about the Earthquake Preparedness Initiative that she's championed through the Southern California Association of Government. And once she comes up here, something else I'd like to say, and something that I really admire her about, is anytime we have a seismic event, she's on TV, she not only informs, but she educates. And essentially, that's what's going to happen here tonight, too. And that's key for us as a city, because we're going to use this as a piece of a puzzle to make our city more disaster resilient. And so with that, I'm just going to hand it over to Dr. Jones. Uh, we need the... And that's what, that's what I'm looking for. All right. And then, and, then, and then there's a pad. Oh, okay. Perfect. Okay. I just want to... Um, Thank you for having me here tonight, and uh, I also want to thank SCAG for the partnership with my center that supports us working with the different cities in Southern California, and um, also to the city of Oxnard for your participation in the, uh, our cohort process where we're trying to help cities that are interested in improving their seismic resilience understand what the issues are and, and move forward on them. Uh, what I wanted to do tonight is just go through a, a, a short presentation to say what really are, what, not some, partly what's your risk, but how do you look at what the risk is? Because I think one of the things that, what, that happens with earthquakes is we, we worry a lot about the faults, we worry a lot about the ground, and we need to spend more time worrying about our cities and our communities because what's really at stake is not so much our individual safety, but the, the future of our cities. So what I want to do is say, say, what's your earthquake risk? There are five components that go into it. One piece of it is what the earth does. We say the hazard. And that's where the faults are, what's the shaking you're going to get, what's the landsliding that will be triggered, what's the liquefaction that would be triggered. But that's what the earth does. And it does it to, to us. And the, the exposure is to what degree we have put our cities at places that receive these hazards. Um, because, you know, there's plenty of earthquakes around that don't do any harm. There was an earthquake magnitude 5.3, uh, you know, last month that if it had been located onshore could have done quite a bit of damage to some community um, because it was offshore. Uh, none of us were actually directly hurt by it. But there's not just the fact that we've put our cities there, but how we build them. And I think one of the, the least understood things is the degree to which buildings can be made stronger than they are, uh, and that the fact that building codes aren't retroactive. So your building's only as good as the building code in place when your building was built. And that has a, a very significant issue. And of course, then the other infrastructure pieces of a community that are at risk. These all increase our risk. We can reduce what we uh, are going to what we will suffer by how we respond and that's where most people emotionally put the earthquake issue they think of the earthquake as that moment at which it shakes and our fear about that and how we respond and this is indeed cre incredibly important but it's not the the total story and the other thing I put the will to recover because when we really look at what disasters do to uh, communities what we see is not just the moment, but how they respond to it and what happens afterwards. And communities and elected officials that respond quickly and effectively and keep people in place and figure out how to respond are much more successful and, and have a community you come back to, whereas cities where too much has happened and they can't get it back together uh, can have long-term consequences that go on uh, forever. Here in... Uh, Ventura County, we are sitting on the edge of a plate boundary. So the uh, North American plate, which is everything from the San Andreas east to Iceland, is moving to the southeast compared to the Pacific plate, which is everything from the San Andreas west out to Japan. So we're talking about very large pieces of the Earth's crust that are moving with respect to each other. And very importantly, it's not straight here. 
If the San Andreas Fault were completely straight, we just move one side past the other, we would have one big earthquake at certain intervals, uh, and that would be it. But because it's bent, just like imagine if you took a place of glass and you were trying to push it past each other, but instead of going past each other, you now have a kink in it. And you hit against it, you'd break up the glass, and you'd end up having to sweep the shards of glass around the corner. Basically, Ventura is a place where we've broken up into lots of little shards and we're sweeping it around the corner. So that all told, Ventura County has the highest risk outside of the San Andreas Fault itself. We have dozens of faults in the region. This is a map from the Southern California Earthquake Center showing what the faults are. And you can see, you know, because they're dipping at different angles, there's essentially no place in this area that isn't on top of a fault at one level or another. Um, and many of them are moving quite quickly. So, as I said, except for being right on the San Andreas Fault, Ventura County has the highest rate of earthquake hazard uh, in California. There's an important thing. I, you can ask me, and I can tell you, what's the likely earthquake on each of these faults? Because earth, the magnitude is determined by the length of the fault. So if the fault's only 30 kilometers long, you really have a hard time getting bigger than about a magnitude six and a half. If it's 1,000 kilometers long, you can have up to a magnitude 8.5. Here in this region, you see we have uh, several faults. Some of them connect to each other, so we have the potential for at least a magnitude 7.5 under this region uh, and, and many different possibilities for it. I want to make the point that we can talk about magnitude, but magnitude doesn't tell you what happens to you. What happens to you is seismic intensity. And that's what we show with what are called shake maps. And you can see how there's red and yellow. Red is extremely strong shaking. I'm showing it here for two earthquakes. The Easter Day earthquake in 2010 called El Mayor Cucapa, uh, down actually uh, within Mexico, but it ruptured up right to the, the American border and caused strong shaking up in the uh, Imperial Valley as well. And then Northridge from 1994 that's on the right. A couple of things to note. Look at the length of the faults that moved. The 7.2 is on a longer fault. And that's the big issue. It, oh, okay, okay, perfect, thank you. Okay, so yes, yeah, see here, this is a much longer fault than this Northridge earthquake, and that's reflected in the fact that the magnitude's larger. So when you hear magnitude, it's telling you how long the fault is that, that broke. But note also how the shaking dies off with distance very quickly. And this dipping fault that's actually you know, not vertical up to the surface, but rather dipping at an angle, you then have a larger area that's literally on top of the earthquake. So you see these very different patterns of shaking. Notice also that because Northridge ruptured up to this direction, up in the Santa Clarita Valley and even over into Fillmore, there was really quite strong levels of shaking uh, because the rupture started here and focused up in this region. So these are, when you look at what your risk is, you really need to think about a lot of possible faults. And I, I therefore, I'm not going to take much time talking about any individual one. We don't know which one's going to be next. If you give me 100,000 years, I can tell you what earthquakes are going to happen. But you probably care about the next 10 years, and that's a random subset of that 100,000-year picture. And that's a very important thing to think about. We want to know, we're, you know, we hate the randomness, but that is a very fundamental feature of the earthquake. So I don't know which one is going to go, but there will probably be one in the Ventura area within the next 50 years or so, just because you have so many that are so fast moving. There's one other earthquake we all need to worry about, and that is on the San Andreas. The San Andreas is the fastest moving fault. It averages about 100 years between any earthquake on any one piece. By comparison, the faults out in this region tend to be several hundred years to a thousand years sort of recurrence interval. Of course, with a, you know, 10 or 20 to choose from, we're still going to probably have one in the next 50 to 100 years. But the San Andreas averages 100 to 150 years, and the last one was 330 years ago. So that's considered the most likely, single like, most likely source of a big earthquake in the United States. When you look at what's going to happen in Ventura because of that earthquake, notice 
this little bulge that comes out here. We did a lot of uh, very extensive computer modeling to try and understand this. And you can see how the basins, the flat areas, trap the shaking and bring in higher levels of shaking. So because you're in the flats here, that means that the soil underneath you is loose. It means that when the waves come off of the San Andreas or off of whatever fault and move into here, they're going to slow down as they move into these loose soils. The problem is they still have to carry the same amount of energy per unit time. So when they slow down, they have to get bigger to carry the same amount of energy. It's a basic conservation of energy process. So because most of Oxnard is in the flats, in the soft soils, whatever earthquake is coming in, you're going to have a several times amplification in what the shaking is. There is a further potential problem that of liquefaction. That's actually a separate issue, but it means if the soils have water in them, and they get compressed by shaking. It's sort of like taking a canister of flour and you tap it on the counter to get it to settle down. Well, when your, the earthquake shakes the soils here, it's tapping it down. The soil compresses. If there's water in the spaces there, the water gets compressed. The water pressure goes up and the sand temporarily acts like quicksand. Quicksand does a notably poor job of holding up buildings, and we tend to see a lot of damage when liquefaction happens, both to buildings and to pipes. And that's another factor that you guys have to just accept. Whenever the earthquake happens, because of your soil, there's going to be somewhat more shaking, there's going to be more risk of liquefaction, and that's going to give you a higher level of damage. That's the hazard. What about the exposure? Uh, you know, you could say we should stay off the faults. The problem is it's really too late. Why do you think the hill is here? Ma something is pushing that mountain up faster than erosion is bringing it down. And this winter showed you how erosion brings down the mountains, didn't it? Right? The fact that the mountains are here shows you that you've got very active faults. Uh, so we've got to accept that we're on the faults. What can we do about it? We need to worry not just about our individual lives, but about our society, because creating a city is a complex setting nowadays, right? Uh, we want to have a society that continues to function after the earthquake. That's what the, my objective in this uh, joint project with SCAG is all about, is we're not saying stop all the damage. That's impossible. What we're trying to do is make sure that Southern California is still livable after the earthquake. Right? And what does it take to be livable? Uh, good, I got this right. You, when you have a city, you've got, first thing you do when you build a city is you build pipes. Underneath everything is our pipes. On top of that system, we then build our roads, we build the houses that we live in, we build the buildings that we're working in, we set up our manufacturing centers, we have power systems, we have transportation systems, we have communication systems. A modern city is a system of systems, and those systems need to continue to work for people to be able to stay here. We talk about a set of critical infrastructure that forms the base on which you run these systems. You need to have your basic utilities, water, electricity, gas, in a modern world, we need communications. We can't keep a modern economy going without communications. And we need buildings to work in. So these are the core set of functions on which we build all of the necessary systems for a modern life. We, again, back, we're not trying to say prevent all damage because we can trade off. Let's imagine we have damaged buildings, but we still have the internet. There are a lot of people who could be telecommuting. They don't have to go into work for a while. They're going to be able to stay here and keep their job going. Or we lose water. That's almost a certainty. The damage to pipes is an extremely significant issue. But we still have transportation. FEMA's got major plans for how they're bringing in water. So we can compensate to some extent, but we can't let the damage go on for too long. I mean, yeah, FEMA's going to bring in drinking water, but how many of you are going to be willing to stay here when you haven't had a shower in a month? and your neighbor hasn't had a shower in a month. Right? It is a very significant public health issue that we're potentially facing. So these are, when we talk about what needs to be done, the buildings are an important issue, but also the fundamental of all of those critical, uh, trans uh, those critical infrastructure systems are important as well. 
When we think about it, water is the single biggest cause. We did a major economic analysis when I was still with the U.S. Geological Survey that was called the shakeout scenario to understand what the big San Andreas earthquake would be like. And what surprised me was how extensive the losses from damaged water systems were. Um, $50 billion dollars is the total losses expected from all the damaged building and structures. It is also $50 billion is the expected business disruption costs from not having water. Most businesses cannot reopen without water. And the water is likely to be out for so long, up to six months, that that becomes the largest, single largest financial piece of our modeling. So it's a very important piece of, of the system. And in general, our water systems are old. They're buried. Nobody wants to think about them. We all have other financial issues that come up, and why spend the money on the hidden pipes? So they tend to be old and in trouble. Um, there is also the issue that all of the water, all of the imported water to the region, are you know the four aqueducts, all cross the San Andreas Fault within the area that's going to break in that earthquake. All of them will be broken at the same moment because to be a magnitude eight means that that's a very long part of the fault, and every one of those aqueducts is breaking at the same moment. There are efforts underway to try and deal with this. The city of Los Angeles is it because of. Uh, uh, Mayor Garcetti's program is, is coming up with new engineering plans for how to retrofit the Los Angeles aqueduct. They've also been able to get MWD and DWR at the table to talk about how to try and address these issues. Um, happens tomorrow. We haven't solved it yet, but I'm, I have hope that we're heading in the right direction. The other thing, as I said, building codes are only as, your buildings are only as good as the building codes in place when they were built. And we have four big categories of buildings that we know have killed people in earthquakes that are continuing problems. None of them can be built anymore, but that didn't make the old ones disappear. So unreinforced masonry, of course, uh, you know, there's been uh, actions in the city or in, um, across the state from 1986. Uh, where some cities have mandatory, some have voluntary programs about retrofitting unreinforced masonry. Soft first store, that, and so here the picture is uh, from 1933, the Long Beach earthquake. This is the 1971 earthquake, the Olive View Hospital. That's what's called a non-ductile concrete building. It's basically, a, many of our commercial structures from the 50s and 60s fall in this category. And then the, um, hmm, the uh, I guess something I did with that, uh, this is the Northridge Meadows apartment in 1994. So that's the soft first story where uh, when you have housing that's uh, um, the first floor is carports and it's um, done with uh, just those poles and then the first floor is weaker, that concentrates the, dam the deformation when the earthquake happens into that floor. There's strong evidence that you've, the previous retrofits of URMs have saved lives. This is what URM buildings often look like after earthquakes. Um, in the Northridge earthquake, nobody died in a URM. The, and that's the city of Los Angeles had done mandatory retrofit. They had had 10,000 URMs. Uh, three quarters of them were retrofitted. One quarter had been demolished. Nobody died in a URM. What surprised me most of all when I actually had the opportunity to do through all the city building department records is that only the URMs actually were damaged at a lesser rate than other buildings. So the retrofit is only intended about saving lives. But in fact, at not the most extreme levels of shaking, at the lower levels of shaking, it reduced the level of damage compared to other buildings, uh, which is really very impressive. And just to let you know, when we've compared the mandatory and the voluntary programs, 88% uh, of, of cities with 88% of the buildings in cities with mandatory programs have been retrofitted, but only 22% in areas where they've had voluntary programs. Um, one last thing to mention is the other, what, something that concerns me is that our building code is a life safety standard. We say if you choose to have such a bad building that it's a total financial loss after the earthquake, that is your choice to make. You just can't kill people in the process. The role of government is to make sure you don't kill anybody. So we have what's called a life safety standard. And uh, the city of Christchurch, New Zealand has a, a city of about 450,000 people in 2010, has a 
uses the same code that we do, has many pretty much the same style of buildings and, and similar enforcement. When they had an earthquake in 2011, it was actually located right in the middle of the city. You can actually see the fault by where the dust is coming up. And um, uh, that was what's called the design earthquake. In the code, it says, this is the level of shaking you have to design for. And they got their design earthquake. The code did better than they thought. They had nobody died in a modern building. And in fact, the code doesn't say absolute nobody should die. It says try to keep that, you know, the collapse level at a low level. And so the fact that no, no partial collapse is period, better than they expected. However, by the time the dust settled metaphorically, um, in 2015, they had had to tear down 1,800 buildings. They weren't, they didn't collapse, they didn't kill anybody, but they were so badly damaged they had to be torn down. And this is what our building code gives us. So right now, uh, actually in front of the state assembly, there's eight, uh, a bill, AB 1857, is proposing to get a group together to develop a, um, do you want me to stop? Shall I finish this up? Okay. Um, uh, AB 1857 is aimed at, at, over the next three years, developing a code that will give us functional recovery, build, buildings that aren't disposable. And I think that's a very important move that we need to make. The estimate is that at most it's going to cost about 1% to increase the cost of construction to go to that uh, reusable instead of disposable level. Um, and I want to point out that what really matters here is not just the people, it's not just the buildings and the money. Earthquakes have really severe social repercussions, and when the damage is too high, people give up and leave. And I, um, ah, I thought I was, I, if you look at the city of New Orleans, in, it has lost one-third of its population because of Hurricane Katrina, and that's a permanent loss. They dropped down to below half. They've recovered some, but they are now at about 350,000 people where they were 500,000 people before Hurricane Katrina. And I don't think they'll ever get their population back. The consequences of really disruptive natural disasters can last for a very long time. So if we come back and look at these issues, I just want to remind you there's nothing we can do about the hazard. And there's really nothing we can do about the exposure at this point. But we can deal with our structural weaknesses, both in our infrastructure and in our buildings. We can look at our ability to respond, and we can bring our communities together to be able to recover. And again, I, I really want to laud um, the activities that have been going on here with Oxnard participating in these cohorts and look forward to being able to continue um, to support you as you try to move forward on this issue because we're all in this together. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Jones, thank you for scaring the bejesus out of us. That's my job. <laughs> Are there any questions for the doctor? So. What I'd like to do um, really quickly is um, I just have two quick um, speaker cards. I want to get, get through those first, and then okay. individual council members will have some quick questions here. Um, Jackie Tedeschi uh, to be followed by uh, Lorraine Efforts, please. Thank you, Dr. Jones. I survived the 1971 earthquake. I lived in San Fernando Valley. And I survived the 1994. Um, if I remember right, I was a blind thrust fault. And I met you several times. Of course, you probably don't remember all the people when you spoke. But I personally was in a small group of people where I met you, uh, more one-on-one. -on -one. So I don't know whether I appreciate this or not. I actually debated of whether to uh, to come to council or even not watch it on TV at home. But I thought, well, I'm here. Um, I was lucky enough to. Uh, have um, earthquake. 
you have earthquake insurance. Um, my husband and I had uh, all state. Had to file a lawsuit. Took four years. It was quite an education. But by um, the speaking that you've done to give people the inf information, uh, we can't put our heads in the liquefaction for sure. And uh, I'll just say thank you for listening. I don't know, if, like I said, I don't know if I should thank you for, for the report or not. <laughs> and uh, when I have been around people, when they even say the word earthquake, I say the E word. Okay, but then there's a four-letter word, and I don't get, get worried, even though sometimes I can maybe say things like sailor. And after that, I just say pray. Um, capital P, capital R, capital A, capital Y, and I hope it doesn't happen in my lifetime. Two's enough. Thank you. Thank you very much. Lorraine Effers, please. Thank you, Dr. Jones, and thank you for having this presentation. I came here specifically to talk about this tonight. Um, I reached out to Councilman Perello to help me clarify that Dr. Jones was actually going to be here because I was unclear from the agenda. I also reached out to the fire chief to say, why are we not publicizing this? This is a major presentation, an incredibly important issue. And the answer I got was that we only have so many seats in the city council and we didn't want to overwhelm the council. I won't even comment on that because there's television and we've had full councils before. We've had overflow in the hall. This is a major issue. As we've heard for Ventura, we always know in California we could be due any day. From my point of view, living at the coast, there's something even in addition. About a month ago, as Dr. Jones mentioned, we had a quake, 5.3 offshore off Santa Cruz. I was standing in the kitchen, felt the shaking very strongly. It was a back and forth, so I know that's not as bad as an up and down. I was a little bit reassured, but I immediately went to my smartphone, my computer, and TV to get the information, and there was nothing. This is the brochure I got from the state. I also have one from the city and from the county. Where I live, you know it's a mix of city and county, so we never know who we're supposed to call or who we're supposed to talk to. It was very hard for me to find out where that quake was, how strong it was, and whether or not there was any danger of a tsunami, because I knew since I felt it so strongly that it, it wasn't that far away. On the TV, it took 10 minutes of channel surfing until one of the channels, and it wasn't our local Santa Barbara channel where I always go first, it was NBC out of LA that had Dr. Jones commenting, and she was the one who said that it was off Santa Cruz, the magnitude, and that there would not be a tsunami. Everywhere I look, down where I am, there are big signs saying you're in a tsunami zone. So. Okay, like I don't know that, like we don't know that. When I put it on next door that Dr. Jones was going to be here, I got so many responses about where, people asking me, where is City Hall? These are county people who don't come here often. They wanted to come, they wanted to know. This information should be out there at a big meeting, or at the very least at an INCO meeting where we let people know, Mayor, you talked about the fact that the council has to do a better job on educating the populace of, of, of the city about what you're doing and what the issues are. This is one of those issues. Thank you. Thank you very much. Pat Brown, please. I too survived 
earthquakes in the San Fernando Valley and moved out here in uh, November of 1993, just before the no uh, 94 earthquake, went back to Woodland Hills where we were and found porta potties all over the place and, and nobody around. Um, uh, so we were very lucky there, uh, lived, live in the mobile home park, and so we got our place leveled, FEMA paid for it, and, um, and so that's that. Um, but I also took the um, uh, training that the city offered um, back in uh, the 1990s, here and um, I feel a lot more comfortable because of the fact that I took all of that um, emergency uh, training and know exactly what to do, have the helmets and all of the equipment uh, that was given to us and the books and whatnot uh, when I took the training. And I would advise everyone who is watching this who has not taken the city's training that the fire department puts on, that they call the fire department and get themselves on a list. And it's even better if you have a whole neighborhood that all goes together and has the same training. Therefore, when it happens, you're all on the same page. You can work together to help each other. Otherwise, it's... Good luck, Charlie. So, uh, and as far as I know, I'm one of the few in my mobile home park that know how, what to do. Um, and uh, and I keep pushing them, people, to, to uh, take the training, but I doubt that any of them have, even though I've done it many times. But I understand all about this. Uh, living in the San Fernando Valley, Van Norman Dam was supposed to let go. I live right next to the San Diego Freeway. They said, uh, everybody is evacuating. The management called me uh, uh, after they left the apartment building and said, you're the only ones left. Will you please watch over the place? And for over a week, we didn't have any water. We had a water truck that would come each day and give us some water. And we'd put it, have to heat it up and cook it in order to uh, drink it. So I've been through all of this. I know exactly uh, what, what to do. And I think everyone in the, who's watching this, tell your friends who aren't watching it to watch it later this week. and. Be there when it happens. Thank you very much. And that concludes the speakers on this item. And um, we do have uh, two additional reports. And I, I do think, however, the presentation um, uh, not only is important, but um, I think just uh, preparedness and uh, resiliency and all the things that were discussed uh, by the doctor are so important. So we'll have questions now by the council, and we'll start with Councilman Madrigal, if we could keep our comments to uh, three minutes and under, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jones, for your presentation. Uh, it was very informative. Thank you to the speakers. Um, Dr. Jones, I really want to thank you uh, by your proactive approach to response and recovery, because I think that's crucial uh, when that unfaithful day will happen. Um, thank you for um, giving us a quick um, intro information as to things that are right around the corner for us and some damage that we had to probably take into consideration. Um, and as anything in life, you can never truly be ready. Uh, but, you know, it always is helpful that you are. I actually do have a couple questions, but for um, the city, uh, so staff. Um, are there on uh, Dr. Jones' presentation, slide 13, uh, page 7 in the handout, um, it talked about uh, buildings that kill. Are any of the city buildings in trouble due to an earthquake? And I'll ask. Good evening. Uh, I'm Scott Brewer, the Emergency Services Manager for the City of Oxnard. Currently, to our knowledge, there are no city-owned buildings that meet either the soft story or the unreinforced masonry criteria. 
There are on our records 34 unreinforced masonry buildings within the city limits and an unknown number of soft story buildings. Okay. Uh, thank you. And I know there's a, a plan by the city in case of an earthquake and you know this may be opening up Pandora's box but is there a plan as to who gets what resources? Is it first come first serve? Is it you know eventually um, you know who, who gets taken care of first? Uh, Councilman Madrigal, I guess it depends on the severity or the nature of the call. We'll triage it. So even from uh, the Northridge earthquake, we had a number of issues. We had a number of gas leaks. We had some places that had open flame candles, which created structure fires, and that took a lot of our resources. And then we had a lot of low nature uh, medical calls from people cutting their feet on broken glass, tripping downstairs, and things of that nature. But the calls came in. I can't tell you how many because I don't recall. But then we just essentially just triage for, for each one of them. All right. Thank you very much. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, and thank you, Dr. Jones. Uh, I've uh, seen your presentation before. I, I represent the city on SCAG, and thank you for being here. Um, actually, I saw you a couple weeks ago in the desert, and I have your book, oh, <laughs> um, which I recommend to people. It's called The Big Ones, How Natural Disasters Have Shaped Us and What We Can Do About Them. Um, so appreciate your work on it, trying to get us ready so that, we, you know, as elected officials, we want to not be able to not hear people say, hey, you didn't do anything about this. You didn't warn us. You didn't try to take. So while we can't prevent it, there are steps we can take. One of the things um, I am very concerned about is water, because we know that probably in all likelihood the water from the north, which uh, supplies about a third of our water, is going to be cut off. Uh, when there is when there is an earthquake, but also I think it may damage our aquifers, and we may not be able to get. Do you, can you say something about our aquifers? Okay. If you only get one third of your water from um, the the state projects, you're in much better shape than most cities. Um, and because about half of if you just cut out landscaping, that will help, right? That landscaping sure. usually uses about half of a city's water supply. Um, the damage, the change to aquifers, it's unlikely that the San Andreas earthquake, which is the only one that will destroy the aqueducts, will really change the aquifers in this region. Now, when you get a really big earthquake in a region, you can shift the aquifer. You can't, it's very difficult to predict ahead of time exactly what the interaction would be. Uh, the 1952 Kern County earthquake caused a lot of uh, wells in this Bakersfield area to go artesian. So it actually greatly increased the production of groundwater. Uh, at the other extreme, the 99 Hector Mine earthquake caused the water table out in that region to drop by 300 feet, which was a crisis for their local water supply. So that, but you need a really big earthquake locally, something over seven locally, and that would not be the same thing as would cut off the the uh, foreign water supply. So, and have you um, have you taken any lessons that you could share from what happened to Puerto Rico after the hurricane? They still aren't back to full power. Okay, I think there's a couple of lessons to, to learn. Um, one of them, obviously, is that systems fail where you're already weak. So wherever you're already having problems where you've had to skimp on maintenance, that's going to be the most likely place to have problems. And I think that's a, a really important part. Um, but I think you can also see one of the things about what happened in Puerto Rico was because the, the hurricane, the eye of the hurricane went down the island. So it really is not the same thing as happened in Florida where the eye of the hurricane went up the side. And that means that you, um, uh, you can't just say, oh, I was in Northridge. Because I'm, so, you know, you were in Northridge and there was losses here. What will happen when you have a seven locally will be so much worse. It's not really a comparison. And so that proximity is really important. And, and I think that remembering that the disasters come in many different sizes and, and being ready for the last one we had may not be enough. Okay. And just finally, a, a resident asked me to ask you this question. And he basically wants to know what it would feel like to have a severe or moderate earthquake in Oxnard, knowing what you know about potential for liquefaction. Okay, so let's 
I'll, let's pick a fault. I'll say that the Oak Ridge Fault or the San Cayetano Fault, which come down basically down to the coast and would be about a 7, 7.2. One thing is above 7, the earthquake lasts for really at least a half a minute. It's much, Northridge was producing energy for seven seconds. But to be up, you know, and, and Landers at 7.3 was producing energy for 30 seconds. So it'll last much longer than what you're used to feeling. Um, if you're right on top of it, you feel both, there's, it's much more, the jerky motion means you're right on top of it. Rolling motion means you're farther away. And so this would be very, very jerky motions. The liquefaction is likely, assuming it's at a time when your water table's high, I'm not actually sure what the state of your water table is. The good part's about drought. If you really draw down the water table, you don't end up with, with liquefaction. So in Northridge, we had almost no liquefaction because the water table was drawn down with the drought. Um, so that'll be a factor of it. But when you get the liquefaction, then, um, I mean, it's, it's standing in quicksand. So we'll see whole buildings not get shaken apart, but sort of like go over on their side and slide down a hill. It's a, it's a different type of, of phenomenon when, when that goes on. Um, the one other point is you worry about tsunamis. We have never seen a significant tsunami. We've never seen it below like magnitude six and a half. You really need the very biggest earthquakes to move enough water because you have to change the shape of the seafloor to get a tsunami. So if, you know, if the shaking, the str really strong shaking is under 10 seconds, there's not gonna be a tsunami. It's when it goes on for a long time that you should leave the beach. Thank you very much, Doctor. Sure. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Councilman McDonald. Thank you, Doctor, for the presentation. I um, was born and raised here, lived here my whole life, all 35 years of it. Um, <laughs> well, maybe twice that. Um, I remember growing up in Santa Barbara in the, in the 60s, and we had a, a one summer where we just had earthquake after earthquake after earthquake. And after a while, you just kind of get used to it. And the building I was working in, we knew it was coming because there was one set of doors that would rattle about five seconds before the earthquake would hit. Would hit. So that was kind of our, our warning system. Um, I like to think I'm hopefully prepared. We've set aside food resources and water resources. and I, I've stored them in an outbuilding on my property because unfortunately my house or fortunately my house is a little over 100 years old on a raised foundation with no attachment to that foundation so that's it, fixable you do know that right if i survive it yeah no so, no i mean before oh, you mean um yeah but, i just get somebody under there to to anchor it down every half time i've bought a house i've had it inspected by a contractor who specializes in foundations and have gotten any retrofits done for before we move in well, that's, uh, that was going to be my next point. I'm, after seeing your presentation, I, I thought I was doing pretty well. Now I'm feeling woefully unprepared. So, um, I, I can make one thing about that. The State California Earthquake Authority, that's a brace and bolt program, they have on their website list of certified contractors who know how to do the work. And uh, if you want to find someone, that's a way to get to them. Okay. I'll, I'll look, thank you for that information. I'll, I'll look that up. I, I've looked at crawling under my house and the days of my crawling under my house are long gone so I'll have to get somebody else to be doing that for me but that's uh, that's good information I think that may be my next step I I chief I don't know if there's a way we can maybe do an additional community meeting or maybe at INCO or, or somewhere else if we can you. you know get some more really advertised up and this is a wonderful presentation I'd love to see the the rest of the community be able to avail themselves to it maybe even Port Wainimi Camarillo you know maybe do a regional type event so Doctor, thank you very much for making the track up and doing the presentation. Thank you very much. Councilman Perello. Um, <clears throat> number one, Doctor, thank you very much for coming. Uh, Fire Chief, I don't know if you were the one responsible for bringing here, but whoever in the city staff was, thank you very much. This is the kind of presentation that makes it worthwhile being a council member. You get to sit here, she's looking right at us, you get first-hand thing here, but this is your hoping to God that there are more people that are watching this on television. This is important. Um, I can tell you that I live in the neighborhood. The lady that talked about being in the San Fernando, Miss Jackie Tedeschi and her husband Bill, um, she lives in my neighborhood. And we got a tremendous amount of stories from her and her husband about what happened, including taking on the insurance agency at the state of California for the people that got shafted. So she deserves a lot of credit. And the CERT program is a tremendous thing we have. I have some hard questions coming up for city staff here in a minute. In a minute. 
but I want to make sure I get my thank yous out of the way. When you mentioned that if there is an earthquake and there's a drought, the, there's not a lot of the liquefaction, how much of the water holding capacity do we lose if there is a if there is an earthquake in a severe earthquake? It, it's very dependent upon the details of the aquifer and the fault. It's just to do liquefaction, you need to have water. Uh, the water table needs to be at least. I think it's 20 feet. I'd have to look that up. It's a, the water table has to be relatively high. 20. To, I think it was down by 30 or 40 feet in in the Northridge area that where we didn't see the liquefaction when we expected to. Um, but then the, how much the earthquake can affect the aquifer? That's a very location specific, and and we've seen a variety of impacts in different earthquakes, but they, it's not really very predictable. And, and I really appreciate, um, we all know that if there's an earthquake, there's a chance we could lose some of the canals. But when you pointed it out that every canal goes over the San Andreas, there's not a chance. I mean, it's going to happen. That's right. And no matter how many plastic bottles we have, we could run out of water. Um, and I appreciate the other council members talking about Puerto Rico. That's an embarrassment to this country, what we've allowed to happen there and still going on. Um, some people of Puerto Rican ancestry live in my neighborhood, and, and I, you don't want to bring it up. It's bad. Very bad. Okay, the questions that are hard, but I got to ask them. We were asked a question by Mayor Pro Tem: How many city-owned buildings? Um, how many buildings were the retrofit? And the answer was, no city-owned buildings, but we have 34 buildings. Are any of those 34 buildings businesses that would contain members of the public? And if they are, what's the plan to force them to be upgraded or demolished and rebuilt? So what we're going to do is going to build off of this program as well. I'd like to publicize uh, the presentation on the city website along with some things as far as retrofitting goes, cert classes and things of that nature to help help our residents. Um, so majority or predominantly a majority of these uh, unreinforced masonry structures off of Fifth Street and Oxnard Boulevard and they are occupied. Um, we can't force them into retrofitting uh, fitting them. We'd have to come up with an ordinance internally to have them do so. Um, but what we can do is advise them to upgrade to uh, earthquake standards, current earthquake standards. Thank you for that. I, I still have a follow-up because I'm not satisfied with the answer. Off uh, Fifth Street and Oxnard Boulevard and they're occupied, are there any businesses conducted in there which would require a city business license? And how can we allow a city business license for a business to operate if they are in that situation? That's probably for the city attorney or development services. Um, we did not do an overlay as to which of those buildings were commercial buildings. Um, we did look at the areas based on the areas and the, the locations. We assume uh, that the majority of them are commercial buildings. Um, so at this point in time, we would have to actually bring up individual addresses. Um, can you give me an idea of how long that would take? If you were to give, if you were being given council direction tonight, how long would that take? With our planning department, probably no more than one to two working days. I hope my fellow council members heard that and we give direction on that because uh, if we put people at risk not knowing going in these buildings, that's um, wrong. When they say that they can't tell them they have to, that is, it's because it's a matter of ordinance. 150 cities in California have passed mandatory retrofit programs on URMs to force the building owners to retrofit them. It's not without cost, and that's one of the reasons it's been a challenge. Um, so Oxnard probably has a retrofit program because every state jurisdiction was required to form one in a state law that was passed in 1986, but they were allowed to define whether or not it was a voluntary or a mandatory program. So, uh, it's been very helpful, that information, but it sounds like a hundred and some have done it. Were any of them mandatory? Oh, 150 were mandatory. And 150, so There's we some, could, Yeah. there's no restriction other than the backbone of the council if they want to make it mandatory? Correct. I hope my fellow councilmen were listening to that. Um, the, second, the second part of these questions, um, Councilman McDonald and I sit on a utilities task force and we've recently, recently found out about El Rio Manor water and an issue there with potential, the ability to service the fire hydrants. Um, I did not know this about the 34, so I want to thank the gentleman that brought that up. Thank you very much. But now that it's in our lap, we can't just kick it down the road. We've got to deal with it. And that's what the public told us 
and we've had members of public council that they're expecting our council to change, to start dealing with these things. There's a cost involved, but uh, tell me what the value of a human life is on the other side. And then, seriously, looking out for the city of Oxnard, if somebody sues us because we could have taken advantage, we didn't, we've got another cost involved. Health, safety, and welfare is supposed to be the highest priority of an elected official. So thank you very much. Dr. Jones, um, really impressive. Thank you. Uh, I mean, mean it, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Dr. Jones, I, I have like, I have three questions. Okay. Um, so um, can you name a city here in California uh, that exemplifies the, the best of the best practices when it comes to uh, preparation, this to this, uh, uh, you know, the, the recovery, the resiliency, all of this kind of thing? Right now, I think the city that has done the most is probably the city of Los Angeles. Um, it's, I, that's a little self-serving because I spent a year <laughs> with the mayor helping him develop the resilience plan. So it is, you know, trying to address the issues that I thought were most important. I think what's most significant, they have mandatory, they had already done mandatory retrofit of URMs. They were the first city to do it. They also did mandatory retrofit of soft first story and non ductile concrete. But perhaps most importantly, and of course, they have a, a municipal water utility, and they've taken that on, and they've got a major plan for changing, for very long term, to shift out the pipes to being earthquake resistant pipes. And one thing that's happened because of that is that they have, um, they've uh, ended up, they made it clear they were only going to buy pipes that were earthquake resistant. Uh, at the time they did it, there was only one Japanese company that made them. They didn't back down, and there are nine companies now that are making pipes that have been certified as earthquake resistant. They've got a, a certification program that any city can take advantage of to, to see which are the water pipes that are, that are resistant. Um, they aren't perfect, and they really haven't dealt with the, the, power, the problems around the power system. I think what Edison, Southern California Edison, is undertaking voluntarily uh, on the earthquake side has been very impressive. It's the biggest change, much more than PG&E is doing. Um, for instance, they're going through and making, you know, getting a seismic evaluation on every building they use anywhere, so they can figure out which ones need to be retrofitted. They're looking at it, fixing the crossing. The electricity is also coming in across the fault, and they're retrofitting that crossing to try and keep the grid from going down. So there are different activities, but if one program, and also the, the Los Angeles program has the advantage of having been written up. So that would, if you want it, we can get you the program, the, the, the plan that was created uh, in 2014 uh, for dealing with those issues. I want to thank you because it, it kind of leads me to the next just comment that um, I don't know in particular with what you're doing with SCAG is to do exactly that, is to come up with the best practice that cities can simply replicate. and. I know Councilman Perello has been our, uh, an individual that has been in particularly focused on um, response and nat uh, natural uh, disasters, and in particular, dams breaking. It's been a large issue with him. Um, but I suggest at some future point we might have a study session to implement the recommendations that could come forward. We're all a little bit jittery with that noise. Really. <laughs> Anyway, um, I'm I'm glad uh, glad that um, I'm glad that you know uh, we will have a future opportunity to to address maybe more specifically with our bandwidth, our capacity. What do we have within our capacity to address like the lowest hanging fruit? Right. Um, because obviously, replacing all the pipes with uh, uh, you know pipes that can't burst. I you know after we just went through a very interesting right. time period over one utility wastewater. And uh, I can only imagine what that would right. be like. I can't even imagine. I, I think that's a really important part of this is that these, you know, the earthquake will happen inevitably, but it is at some future time, and you've got a lot of other demands. And so it's figuring out how to, to balance that out and find the most appropriate things. And that's actually part of what this cohort process has been. That you have, that your city staff have been participating in, is getting together with other cities uh, in this region, in Ventura County, that are also trying to address it and sharing ideas and, and best practices. So it's trying to to support cities as they move forward on this. And just the last question and comment: I spent a, a considerable amount of time, and I do in in San Francisco, and I've lived there. 
And I know that the 1906 earthquake, which uh, as a history teacher uh, still fascinates me, um, I know that 3,000 people died, two-thirds of the population was left homeless after the earthquake, uh, but the majority of the damage, 90% of the damage in San Francisco came from the rupturing of gas lines. Do you have any idea um, what it is today? I mean, obviously, today is far advanced from San Francisco in 1906, but um, what can you say about that? As, as well, well one thing with San Francisco that's become clear with some recent historical research is that, yes, the fires were very devastating. Many of them were actually set by the army that had come in. They thought they were going to be trying to, like, they were trying to create fire breaks yes, to stop the fire, dynamite. and then they, mm -hmm. they caused more. So uh, it's not all the broken of the gas mines. Uh, in recent earthquakes, there was a study done of Loma Prieta Northridge in San Fernando, and... Um, uh, 25% of the fires were started because of gas problems. 60% were caused by electrical issues. And then the remaining were a variety of chemical and, and other factors. So uh, the fire following earthquake is terrifying to me. And it's, uh, it scales the smaller earthquakes. In Northridge, we got them under control because of mutual aid and a huge effort. When the earthquake scales to that much larger, mutual aid is going to have to be coming in from the Bay Area or Arizona and will take longer to get here and it's going to be a much bigger issue. So um, it's particularly terrifying what happens with the, with the electrical, I mean with, with the fires, but it's only partially the gas and working with the electrical system about ways to reduce some of those losses is really important too. And just a final comment just uh, on history that um, apparently, Santa Rosa, California, San Jose, California were also completely destroyed from that San Francisco earthquake. Right. So I'm thinking not just one city, um, but God forbid, a multitude of cities that are just absolutely leveled. You know what? You know the the proportion of the response. I just can't begin to grasp it. Well, I, thank you, because I think that's the most important issue. The really biggest earthquakes are bigger because they're longer faults. And that means that many more cities that are directly on top of it. San Jose, San Francisco, Santa Rosa all sat on the San Andreas Fault. Down here, we're talking about the whole Coachella Valley, San Bernardino, Palmdale, Lancaster, all of those communities being on the fault and then extra shaking coming out at greater distances because of our basins and our, the loose soils I was talking about. So, yeah, you're going to, that's the biggest issue. Thank you very much. And I, I just know what we have an emergency uh, preparedness, you know, director who's, who's also very responsive. And uh, I'm looking forward to future study sessions on how we might be able to implement the very ideas that you've helped the mayor and the city of L.A. with. Thank you. I appreciate thank, it. Thank you very much. Thank Thank you, Chief. And that concludes that um, item, and we're very grateful. Thank you very much. And uh, we have two remaining items, which are reports on page four.